Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Pinksado's Place. We've got the one, the only Jack Antonoff as our guest this week. That's always a good conversation. You're definitely going to learn something we always do. But first, it's the era of the aura, the final three winners in a contest that just went worldwide in such amazing ways. I mean, we had entries from India and Russia and Canada and Belgium and South Korea and Malaysia and on and on and on because this is a hot piece. The winners of week four are Michelle Landry from Michigan, Kevin Luna from Las Vegas, Nevada, and Alexander Schneider from Privat, Germany. Congratulations to all the winners. Congratulations and utilize it. Congratulations and become a stud. And congratulations and say, I found that on Pensado's Place. Thank you, AKG. Really incredible. Um, also, what else is good for you is NAMS Believe in Music Week. It's coming up next week, January 20th. We're taping this on Tuesday the 11th. Um, and all kinds of panels, sneak peeks at gear, all truncated into one day. A number of very interesting interviews. If you want to join us, go to attend.believeinmusic.tv. I'm going to co-host with Joe Lamont, the chairman of NAM. Um, we're going to have a couple little Pensado segments. One of them is going to be Take a Day Trip. And the other one is a special guest that I'm working on. And we'll announce that in social media probably in the next eight hours or so. So 1.30 will be Take a Day Trip, PS Pacific Time. And 4.30 will be our special guest once we get uh, all that finalized. But all day will be good stuff for you to find out. So again... Head to a head to attend.believeinmusic.tv right away and you'll enjoy it. And remember, NAM in person is still scheduled for June 3rd through the 5th in Anaheim. So stay tuned, mark your calendars. They're gonna obviously do this in a safe way. So, but right now it's still on and popping. So keep that registered. Um, hit us up on our socials, like and subscribe, click notify. We certainly appreciate that. And without further ado, the one, the only, producer of the year, musician of the year, artist of the year, just dude of the year, the one, the only, Jack Antonoff. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, big, big blushing happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, uh, good to see you again, Jack. Good to see you guys. I'm so happy to talk to you guys again. I missed yeah, you. Well, we got to do it uh, not same just here. on here. <laughs> same here. Well, the, so the, the fun part is, um, you know, there's some producer of the year nominations here um, in the Grammys, but I know one of the passion projects. I love when really talented musicians have passion projects. You've been on the road with the Bleachers, man. Tell, tell me about the Bleachers and what's yeah. been happening. Bleachers Taurus was this moving target, obviously. And um, it's it's something that, you know, there, there's some, I never thought touring was a fragile thing. Right. I always yeah. assumed um, I always thought, you know, you, when you grow up m making music, you, you hear, you know, press, radio, this crap, this crap. These are things that pies in the sky. But if you just go out and you play and you play to people and you play your guts out, then you can find your people and you can keep playing to them. That was sort of the idea I was raised on. And that left me with this feeling of, well, this thing is protected, which is really foolish. And um, when the pandemic happened, I just it, I just it was incredibly for the touring world, bizarre and sad that that was just yeah. gone. So, you yeah. know, that, that's a sacred space. Nobody goes to a show cynically and whatever uh, massive like church like energy was already at shows. It just kind of notched up a level. Yeah. Cause every, and I think you could say it's about recording too. Everything is, is barrier of entry. Like if, if something's super easy to do, you know, just like pick up the phone and do something, you bring a little less energy than you get on a plane and go somewhere. Right. Um, right. And I always, and touring is always that. It takes a lot for people to come together. And now it yeah. takes more and you feel it. Yeah. It, touring was, touring is kind of like American democracy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you thought it was like rock hard. And then it was like, wait, this is fragile. We got to take exactly. care of it. We got to take care of it. And then not to get too deep on it, but it also sort of like restored faith a little bit for me and my band of like seeing, seeing people come together. Yeah and have it work and not be a shit show because I think a lot of our examples of people coming together in the past couple of years make one feel like things don't work. Right. You know, the Senate doesn't seem to work, you know, right. when people, right. 
yeah. right. go out and take to the streets, crazy shit happens. And like, you're like, well, what the fuck works? Um, yeah. So in our tiny, tiny, tiny corner of the sandbox, being able to, you know, we went through a lot, the crew went through a lot, the audience goes through a lot, you know, yeah. to be there. You could almost argue you're risking your health. To see everyone working so hard to just make something work made the world feel a lot less like a broken family. My, yeah. my, my world, at least. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to start my stuff off with, with, with an obscure thing. So um, I can't remember where I heard this, guys, but C.S. Lewis once said, uh, when everyone is rapidly jumping off the cliff, one person, which is us, is going in the other direction and considered crazy. <laughs> and that describes, that describes me. I think that describes you. Uh, and I think that describes all of us that are, he- that are here. We, everybody's going the wrong we're going the right way. Everybody else is going the wrong way. I'm not jumping off a cliff. No, I, I feel that. I feel like, um, I also think that there was, I don't, that makes me think of the pandemic and being home and having this place that, is, that was unchanged, which is the studio, you know, which is, uh, yeah. When you say that, that makes me think that, you know, when everyone sort of filed into a room alone, a lot of us who often are in a room alone had had the right idea, which is that that's okay. Yeah, yeah. And it turned out that those rooms became places for people now to to gather. You know, we, um, um, I think too often too, um, because this is such a, such a paradigm shift that a lot of us have to talk about some of the good stuff yeah. that's happening. The music is incredible. The development of tools have been incredible. Um, music has done what music does, which is pull people together, serve as glue, be a salve. Um, well, the whole like the whole like this is the worst time in history is a dangerous game because yeah, you can you know you could ask some people who've been around longer than you, or and and you can hear some stories, and you might think to yourself, and that that's not to feel disillusioned, to not to fight, and to not right. want things to get better, but. At some point, and I think I start to feel the seeds of this. Some people out there, I'm feeling it. it you, at some point, we have to um, experience joy, also. Yes. And and experience joy outside of the lens of shame about joy, because the world is so fucked up. Absolutely. Um, you need both, but so it's very interesting to be. I think it's a little easier for for artists and, and musicians and whatnot because. Um, that's the whole dance of this is, is a lot of, a lot of rage, a lot of shame, a lot of darkness. And then you flip it into joy through the song or the recording. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also the dance of where the world's at right now. Like is, is, is a lot of bad stuff going on, but um, it's almost like you're not honoring uh, the experience of being alive. If you can't mix in some joy there too. Is, yeah, is, absolutely. And, you, and you hear these stories. I mean, for me as a, for me growing up uh, Eastern European, Jewish in America, I heard mm-hmm. the stories of my grandparents. Oh no, did I freeze or am I good? I'm good. You're good. Um, I heard the stories of my grandparents fleeing Europe to get out of the Holocaust and immense amounts of joy and family and food and music and all these things within that. Yeah. And I've been really, uh, you know, so, so I, I do think we're living through one of those times where it's like, there's this weight of shame of like, how am I supposed to feel joy now? But also, how dare you not feel joint right now? Absolutely. How does it affect your writing? Does does the times that we're in is it affecting you lyrically or way, the way you write, or do you, are you able to dismiss it and, and and segregate your head? You know, it's funny. Like I always think I'm about to be affected. I think it depends on the kind of writer you are. You know, I think some mm-hmm. people are really commenting on the world. I've always found the most to write about just in my life. You know, uh, I call it like sandpaper, like this sort of feeling inside you or I don't know, some people might call it depression or anxiety, but mm-hmm. it's always kind of calling to me. So anytime I find myself wanting to comment on the world, I end up just writing another song about um, what it's like to be me and what it's like to be me feeling grief or joy or whatever. So, it, so, mm-hmm. you know, I have utter respect for people who can do it, but it's never been my style. Mm-hmm. 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 The, the, the thing that is always so fun for me, with guys like yourself, you know, I have this conversation with Dave Cobb, or we have this conversation with James I love Cobb. Dave Cobb. Such Dave a Dave Cobb fan. blows yeah. me away, man. He's, I'm, I'm just a fanboy, just like with you. But you guys have such capacity, and then you find projects where you can have the different jacks 
present. The bleachers would be different than what you do with Taylor Swift or whatever you were you and Verdeen were in noodling about, which Verdeen talked to me about on air. We had a ball with that. Is the um, coolest. Oh, he is the coolest. Is the coolest. So, <laughs> yeah. So the various jacks in terms of musical persona, direction, desire, what what itch does do the bleacher scratch for you? Bleachers is, you know, I've always, you know, I've always, I've always done what I, what I do today, which is so if you, when I was 14 or 15 and I first started becoming really interested in, um, in, in, in music, you know, I would, I would sit because, because these are different things, right? So if you produce records, you don't necessarily write music. If you write music, you don't necessarily write lyrics. So um, I've always kind of loved them all separately. Like I always wrote even before I was playing music. And then I always, when I, you know, 13, 14, 15 there, I, I started playing instruments and writing my own songs. Um, but then at the same time, I also was recording them, which is a different love. And then at the same time of that, I was also really interested, which I didn't realize was being a producer because I just thought it was having fun. But at the same time, I would help my friends with their records. Mm-hmm. And I would love to, and, and like I said, at the time, that's just what it was. We were all in bands and I had a, I think it was a VS840. Was it, I don't know if it was called it's the rolling machine that used a, a zip disc. Um, that's too old. <laughs> it was, it was, it was like, it was in that crazy, it was, it was in this interesting period of time, I guess call it 2000, 1998, 9, 2000, where the M box hadn't come out yet. Um, so, you know, the Pro Tools M-Box in, in, my, in my lifetime was, was the huge shifting moment. I think that's what, like 2002 or three? Um, yeah, but, that, but that's when, uh, you know, because before that, I remember thinking Pro Tools was like $50,000 or something. And, you know, it wasn't attainable. And it also wasn't attainable to have a tape machine. So at that time, we were, it was four tracks or weird, I think it was the Roland VS840, I think. But it was this weird grace period in between where there was like zip drive machines it's basically like a eight track or something um but i had one and so at the time i thought i was having fun with my friends but i was doing the same thing i do now which i was producing other people's albums speaking mm-hmm. of which um the taylor swift record um um man i don't know how to describe it uh what what was the what were your thoughts and in, in, in emotions surrounding that record and and how much of i know you like to, to get most of your stuff into the most of your thoughts and in, 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 into the lyrics but how 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 did that record get to get get put together and and was that one of the first records you considered yourself producing the which one like early taylor stuff or most recent the re- recent one that was the folk one that was a that was a true pandemic project we, we did it at a distance and I've worked with her for a long time. We've worked on many different things. And we basically have, Taylor and I have three versions of our process. One is we sit in a room together. Two is she'll send me a song and I'll produce it. And three is I'll send her a track and then she'll work off that. Um, and they're all, they're all different. But uh, So Folklore was the first time that, you know, either she sent me a song or I sent her a track. And that's how those songs were made. We, we were in the room together once. And we even recorded separately. Um, I didn't see her until that album was 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 done, and that's a perfect example of the pandemic bringing this unknown element. Like that album, yeah. I don't I don't think would have happened. I think the whole structure of normalcy going away. She just had these ideas that were brilliant. So I would sit here in this room. I remember songs like one of my favorite songs, a song called August, and kind of work up music beds and these tracks within what she's imagining send it to her and then sort of you hear these stories but they're very true with taylor you just get a voice note back not too long later and it's the whole thing and it's amazing and then and then we did a pretty exciting modern version of recording where i was here taylor was in her house and laura cisco engineers set up a system and um was listening in and got all the takes and then Laura sent me all the takes. We went through it and just made it. And, and this was, this was during the part of the pandemic where you really couldn't do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it made me feel really hopeful and it made me feel like these creative relationships that we're lucky to have 
are much bigger than 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 the confines of of, of being in a, a proper studio or even being in the same place. You tend to work with more female artists than male artists. Is that intentional, or is that just um, the way it goes? I don't know. Yeah, I, it's an interesting one because it's a. I've never figured out a proper. I always sort of get a little stumped when when it comes up. It's it's clearly true. Um, I don't know. You know, you always. Uh, I've never I've never found a good answer for it. <laughs> in my mix in my mixing career, I've, I've had more big records with women for some reason. I don't know why. I think I'm. I think I'm. I mean, I don't know if these are, you know, formed ideas, but I I, I definitely feel a sense of amazement and wonder at um a lot of, like a lot of my favorite singers are, are female i think there's mm-hmm. something about uh yeah. you know obviously people have very different tones and it's all over the place but just growing up like you know I, I would hear male singers and feel like there was something i could recognize in it that maybe i could do a little bit of but then when i hear female singers i remember hearing kate bush as a kid mm-hmm. and thinking like mm-hmm. i don't I, that sound is from outer space and, and so there's a wonder there that i think um might make me more useful as a producer or something. Well, I'm going to be contrarian, but you like Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. Well, yeah, but that's, but that's, but that's the, the exact opposite. Bruce's voice and his lyrics and his sound are so recognizable to me because he's talking about the, that, that he, he, for me, swings so far in the other direction, which is, so that was the first time that I had heard someone describe the feelings and landmarks of the place I'm from. Yeah. In a way, because when you're from New Jersey, it's, it's, it's a silly story, but it's true. Every, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very like made fun of place. So you grow mm-hmm. up with that feeling and you think this place sucks. This place sucks. Mm-hmm. I guess I suck. And so <laughs> we have, we have very few heroes, you know, it's not like you're from New York city, man. Like take your pick, you know, like right. you, you go velvet underground, you go, you go anywhere you want, you know, if you're exactly. from, and even like, you know, I think about, Minneapolis, you know, you have Prince, but like Minneapolis isn't a shit on place. Minneapolis is an amazing place, an amazing right. musical history. San Francisco, you know, Austin, obviously Nashville, all, all over the world. New Jersey is just has some of the worst PR for whatever mm-hmm. reason. But I heard Springsteen as a kid and I thought, whatever the hell he's doing, he's giving me a lot of pride. Mm-hmm. And he is doing something that I recognize in a very deep way. And I feel it in myself. And I want to, I want to, I want to, you know, whatever doors he's pushed down, I want to, I want to walk through them because I feel, uh, I feel like I see myself in it. You know, it's funny. I used to live in Jersey, um, Gutenberg, right down on the water. And I was in New York so much, had a New York office and years back. And Sometimes, depending on who, where the fireworks were going to be, if they're going to be in the East River about the Hudson, yeah, you would have yeah. people come down and watch. And I, for some reason, during this Fourth of July, I felt just empowered to go get my big ass stereo, put it on the balcony, and after the fireworks went off, I played "Born in the USA" <laughs> at about DefCon Nine <laughs> about twenty times in a row, and people would look up at the balcony and go. That's a black dude playing that, man. I was, I was up just, I was feeling that. That, that, that shit sounds like it was recorded at DefCon Nine. I mean, if you go back to that record, like yeah. he, he is borderline screaming. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, like it's really a lot of those. A lot of one thing I love about Springsteen recordings is like they're they're pretty fucking unhinged. Yeah, like you know, like you you go back to you know, obviously his lyrics, his melodies are so strong that. When you think of born in the USA, you you, you hear the, the the synth line, you hear the vocals, you think yeah. of born to run, you think tramps like us, but you go back to recording, it's like they're they're playing like the drumming on born to run is insane. It's absolutely mm. insane. And then the way it was recorded, it's almost like it almost sounds like a damp Fleetwood Mac sounding kit, but he's playing it so fucking hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I um I'm constantly, I'm sure you guys get like this, but fascinated with my impression of a recording in my head versus, oh, sure. the, versus the reality of it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Also, also, oh, yeah. You, also, you left out Clarence, man. Some of the sax work on all those songs. Was insane. 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 And also recorded in like a really aggressive, like it's just, um, it's, it's damn the it's torpedoes. Just 
yeah, it's just go for it. And yeah, no question. No question about it. And then, and then on the flip side, I was listening to, um, I was listening, I was, I guess, listening in my head to Nine Inch Nails. I was thinking about some of those recordings. And then I went and put on the actual record. And I mean, this is a compliment. They're much more, they're much more contained and smaller than I remember. Mm. Yeah. Which I think mm. is, is something that you can do if you're, you know, uh, th- those sounds are so aggressive in my head and so compressed and like, nuts and and the record was like way more there was a lot more space in it and and got me thinking about a concept which maybe we've talked about before but you know leaving space for someone to think something's bigger than it is yeah, yeah. at some point in time i think we're gonna have to pass a law that we can't be using anything 40k and below at some point <laughs> <laughs> like like a man how about a mandate from that gavin well that, that that's interesting because like like dave when you're and you're mixing. Yeah. How how much how much space are you trying to leave versus how much space are you trying to fill mm-hmm. versus like how does the way other records sound affect that? Like like are you do you get in like a loop of worrying about how yeah. big a record sounds? Well, you know, um it's a lot. I'm not I'm not saying that I'm as good as you are trying to compare myself to you. Yeah, you're a lot better. But when you're when you're in that when you're in that mode and you're in all the, all the parts of your brain that are creative or firing, you don't really think and, and, and those moments don't last long either. So, um, I'm a product of my childhood. I'm a product of my environment. I'm a product of my family, my entire family. So I like, uh, like, like you got a little bit of your aggression from, from your punk rock days. I, I got it from my, uh, from my early African American, artist days, you know, uh, uh, Twyla Tharp, Big Mama Thornton, those, those artists that just gave you everything. And, you, and, and so I like mm-hmm. space. I like, and, I, and, um, you, you mentioned that you like to shock people sometimes. I like to, I like to, I don't, I, I don't know if shock is the right word for me, but <clears throat> I like to make them, I like to set them up to hit, think they're, they're going to hear something and then, and then change it, you know? Yeah. And then I think that's and, and and then I like I like I like hit, I like relying heavily on eighth notes and I like um, I can go on all day. This is your no, show. I love this. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, this is fascinating to me. I got a question for you. I I think I talked to Harvey Mason Jr. about this a bit. Actually, after the last Grammys, which by the way I thought your performance with Taylor was really cool. I thought the Grammys actually last year from a production standpoint was refreshing. And I had a great, it was, it was, they did it so right. It felt like, um, and also it reminded me like you take away all these thousands of people at the Staples Center or whatever. And in a, in a weird way, the artists, like they they just actually get to sort of see each other more because there isn't like this, like crazy energy of like competition. It's just like, we were just like sitting at like a dinner. It, it was so cool. It came off so cool. The performances were so cool. The set pieces were so cool. I loved you guys in the house and doing your thing. Um, and and part, I sometimes feel like the Grammys are beleaguered, overly beleaguered. And while it's trying to look, there's things that can do better. There's no question. Um, but we're in this constantly evolving technical revolution called music that's got tech companies in it and in the, you know it's it's changed and it's more so every organization has to morph and change with it do the, are the grammys i mean you're up for producer of the year you've got daddy's home you know saint vincent all best alternative you you've been up a number of times you're a state is the are the grammys still an important thing to you and the, does it resonate and or is it, it yeah it well, i mean i i think that it, it, it absolutely means means a great deal to me i think you have to you have to put these things in a reasonable place inside yourself. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's a bit like your birthday. You know, if your birthday means everything to you, then one day you might hate your birthday. And one right. day, you know, you might say to yourself, well, fuck this. You know, I'm canceling my birthday. You know, I'm, with, I'm, I'm withdrawing my fucking birthday. You know, <laughs> but, but the truth is, it's like, but if you use your birthday as a moment to say, damn, you know, I, I really like my friends and family. And it might sound cheesy, but I'm, I'm honored to be here and, and I'm yeah. honored to, and life moves so quickly. And especially if you're an artist and you're just flying towards the future, you're looking at the future. Um, it, you don't 
you're not offered a lot of moments where people say, stop. Hey, we, we, you know, we love you. So birthday is yeah. a perfect example. You know, if it was your birthday, they heard, then we'd say, Hey, we're going to take one second of the program and just stop and say, happy birthday. Happy you're, birthday. you're a great friend. We love you. And, 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 and I think that is exactly the best place to hold the Grammys. You know, if, if your life's goal is to win Grammys, then, then you're going to hate the Grammys. But if you right. can you go out there and, and make your work because for a much deeper purpose, as, as most of us do, and then an organization comes along and says, nice job. Uh, we, we, you know, it, it, at its best is its opportunity to, to say, wow, you know, that, that means a lot to me. And, and I really feel very, we do the same dance every year. Mm-hmm. Those, you know, those who are nominated are thanking their mom and their music teacher. And those who aren't, are, you know, saying that the organization's corrupt. And it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit exhausting because, yes. Um, there's plenty of ways, there's many, many ways to become successful in, in music, which is not a popular yeah. concept, but it's true. Right. You know, right. when, you're talking right. To your, when you're talking to your guidance counselor, they say, well, call me when you win a Grammy. But the truth is there's so many jobs here beyond that. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I've, 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 I've been lucky enough to be nominated. I've been not nominated. Uh-huh. And it's, uh, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think some, I think the people who are over belabor it are sort of potentially looking for something there that isn't meant to yeah. be found in awards. Yeah. I, um, I, I think you hit on the part that, that sort of, I, I support you. I support somebody's voice, but it's too easy to make something a political tool. And then. And I, and I know, I know that, you know, I've, I've, I've done my research on that organization. You know, we're not talking about the golden globes here. We're not talking about, right. you know, 90 people who get gifts and, 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 and it's one right. big inside job. Like I know enough. I know people who get their health insurance through that shit. Like it, you know, it, it's, it's a bigger thing. If you're just going to shit on it, you should probably fig- find out everything they're doing when it comes to music education, when it comes to 100%. taking care of musicians, when musicians die, that organization is often there. We, we all have friends. So I, I do think that, um, it's usually these voices who are hyper-focused on ego and the award and all these things. When in truth, that that's a piece of the thing. And it's actually a very large community and resource for people who, uh, who, who need help sometimes. And, and, and I, we can tell you specifically that um, we have personally been involved where we music cares. We got them to step up and take care of somebody for a year. They didn't hesitate. Um, I've seen everything from rent to yeah. you know, health, to, to, to advice, to career advice, to yeah. opportunities. And, and I think the other fundamental thing that is important to understand is that by and large, the Grammys are your peers. Like, like these are groups of people trying to do the right thing to, they're not getting it perfectly right, but, but, you know, before we tilt it, tilt at windmills and, and destroy our institutions, we know what that is writ large let, let's be careful about well, yeah and I, and I also like last year i remember we were i was with all the people that i was nominated with for last year and we were watching the whole pre-telecast mm-hmm. so the pre-telecast is often um it's pre-telecast for a reason it's because a lot of the people there are less famous and draw less That's viewers right. but That's they're right. often you know some of the best artists out there yes. and you're watching this thing and there was a lot and there was a lot of conversation last year about the stuff we've been discussing and you're seeing these people who are feeling a level of pride mm-hmm. and joy and humble, uh, a, yeah. a, a real humble quality, whether they're winning or losing. And then, you know, you see some people winning and, and they're talking about uh, their journey. They're talking about their loved ones. They're talking about what they've given up for their art. Right. And you're in right. this little moment, you know, they're not saying I'm going to be fucking rich now and I'm going to do this and f- fuck everyone. They're, they're just taking it as this, this sign of, Wow, I've come very far. It's a very, very beautiful moment from artists that you hadn't even necessarily heard of before. Yeah, and it just makes you feel a little bit shitty when some of the biggest artists in the world just take a take a shit on the whole thing because you know what? Yeah. It isn't always about the biggest artists in the world. That's exactly because when right. you're an unknown artist and you get nominated for a Grammy, woo! It's big deal. It's it's a big fucking deal, and it's not anyone's job who is at the top to say that that's shit. Right. No question. So, okay. so that's, that was kind of my overwhelming feeling, seeing all of that of like, you don't like it. You got a problem with it. That's totally cool. But like, there's a lot of good there and, and, and take a peek before you go nuts and, on it. And a, and a new administration 
that is, you know, when I met Harvey Mason Jr., I was having an artist I managed being produced by Rodney Jerkins. We took this long ride deep, deep, deep into New Jersey, not far from Philly. Hey. And and walked into Rodney Jerkins thing, and there was some guy named Harvey who was the mix engineer. And so when I think about the fact that the Grammys is headed up by one of us, you know, a guy who is literally still produces records, still and, and a smart guy, and, and it's it's I, I'm perfectly willing to be objective in my you know criticism and my research, but I haven't seen this bad thing yet. I see people trying to take something and make it better. Yeah, and I just I got to ride with it for a second before, before I, I'm with you. And I, and I also feel like, you know. Don't make perfect the enemy of. Uh, of good, is that the phrase? Yeah, <laughs> but, but, you know, like, yeah. like we got some real problems in music, you know, like question. Why do why does our merch get taxed when we go tour? Hello. You know, question, you know, what the hell yeah. is going on with ticketing and why is scalping legal if it comes from a huge corporation? You know, like, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, yeah. there's, there's there's real shit out there that we got to figure out. Um, yes. And I'm not sure endlessly uh, combing through the same bullshit um, about people's sour feelings about award show is really where I want to put my energy. Um, 100%. So that that's my that's my hot take. <laughs> what do you what do you what are you working on that excites you? They, or can you talk about it? Uh, I am in one of my favorite moments ever because I don't I don't have to be anywhere. Uh, and, and I know you guys know this feeling when you're home. You got your studio set up close by. Yep. You think you want time off. So you have like, you know, two weeks or whatever where no one's asking you to do something and you find right. yourself every, every day going in and, and messing around. And Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I favorite. tell people, I tell people one of the coolest things about, you know, obviously the pandemic's had horrific impact, lots of people. But I got to tell you, it's so cool to walk to work. <laughs> I walk down the hallway. <laughs> yeah. I turn left. And I'm at work. <laughs> and oh, it's, my it's, favorite, it's, I, I wake up in the morning. The first thing I do, I turn left uh, also, is I turn on the studio. Yes. First thing I do before, and then I go and I brush my teeth and I sort of get myself together. Yeah. Then I go and make yeah. coffee and kind of like, but just like knowing that it's like booting up and, yeah. you know, there's a lot ready. of analog stuff in here. Yeah. And I just maybe, you know, Laura, who engineers with me is in LA, so she'll may have sent me some sessions. I'll start downloading. It's just like, there's, there's such a uh, sacred sort of like trip like a uh, process to process it. of turning on the studio and you, yeah. when you turn it on you can't help but have that feeling of like maybe today is the day i don't know Something's <laughs> gonna happen. Yeah. yeah 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 absolutely hey jack um i've got a i've got a 20 part question um uh, i'm curious about your about the way you start your process do you have a favorite instrument you start with you start with a a, a title of a song on a napkin <laughs> or do you start with with an idea, a melody, and then and then flesh it out, or or do you do you like the, the collaboration process to help you start with? Can you give me some insight and in how? Yeah, how you... they're they're pretty. I mean, there's it's it, it's pretty unfigured out still. <laughs> what what gets you where I'm going? <laughs> um, which is a bummer, but it's, it's how I've always been. And I um, but there, there's things like you know the the, the low end on a Juno six specifically mm -hmm. Juno six, not sixty, not one hundred six. Maybe 60, but definitely not 106. Um, there's something about that sound that I don't know if it's my voice on top of it, it makes me want to write. Um, something about a U, U1 upright piano, if you put the felt on, that those tones make me want to write. You know, I love more than anything playing a grand piano. I don't get that feeling. Mm. So, so um, mm. there are certain sounds like I love anything repetitive and arpeggiated i love some sort of arpeggiated line and then i can change chords on top of it it just sort of already mm -hmm. makes you feel uh like you're in the bed of a song mm -hmm. um interesting i don't really get it from drums like i usually write something before i start putting any actual like mm -hmm. drums or rhythmic information on it mm -hmm. um but for the most part but then you know sometimes it's an idea of a, a word or a concept of a song Sometimes it's a sonic idea, you know, sometimes you listen to something and you just want to drown everything in reverb and you're messing around and that's how it comes out. Do you, um, ever, uh, do you ever put yourself and pretend like you're someone else and then write from that perspective instead of uh, from your perspective? Not that, but I've, but I've, I've been like, but I have found myself like sort of like 
you know, like maybe I'll record a cover today and I'll like record someone else's song. And then I'll be like some sound or something. And I'll just mm. be like, and I'll take a left turn and end up in a totally different place that I don't know the, the joy of like singing up someone else's song sometimes makes you want to write something totally different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, ha- and last question on this subject. Uh, how, how has your writing changed from, from 14 year old to zero the year old? It's it's funny because in some ways it's all it's so different, and in some ways it's the same thing. You know, it's like uh, you can't really escape this part of yourself that is your process, right? You right. can get to know it better, mm-hmm. um, but my process isn't isn't terribly different. Um, I think I'm I've, I've worked really hard to get better at the craft around the thing. You know, so if I want to hear a sound, I'm remarkably better than I used to be at getting that sound. I remember a time in my life, um, whether it was a lyric idea or a sound or a melody, if I had an idea for a thing, it was very hard to make it happen because I didn't have the, so I'd have to go on sort of a bit of a chase to find it. Um, So now I can sort of make it happen quicker, uh, which is, that's sort of the craft of the thing. But the idea, which is the most important thing, that's, it's a fucking slot mm-hmm. machine up there. It just comes or it doesn't. That's good. Do you, do you, do you compose on piano on a specific instrument or just sometimes I have, I like, I, there's a U one in here that I, I like to compose on. Um, but, but sometimes, you know, it's, uh, there's something about a Juno six. I'm on it all the time. I always go back to it. Um, I don't even mess around that much with, with tones. I, I pretty much like kind of that, you know, Streets of Philadelphia, which I still think was a DX7, but that kind of like pad hummy mm-hmm. thing. Like it, mm-hmm. I love it because um, it's just like a bed. And so you could really put anything on it. Like it's just, it's so the, the pad, especially if you have the release on, it's just, there's so little rhythmic information. You can sort of go anywhere. Whereas piano mm-hmm. or guitar, you know, as soon as you hit it, you, you've, you've implied a rhythm. Um, mm-hmm. And there's something about uh, the way I have my Juno set where it just, it's pretty ethereal, so it, you could, it, it lets me go anywhere. Mm. Mm. Would you say that 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 because because the one I like the one of six better than the six, but would you say that 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 the eighties musically was one of your decades that you got the most from? Yeah, I would say seventies and eighties. Mm. Yeah, I mean, from a there's something about the eighties that I really rely on which was this uh big darkness yeah you know um i think in the 60s and 70s you had a lot of small darkness you know the big big record in the 60s and 70s from in my perspective yeah usually were were more joyful and then you know there was a lot half of england was depressed so (laughs) (laughs) probably and then in the 80s you start hearing a thing that is more recognizable to me which is uh, a darkness with a hope in it you know like Yes. Why does Depeche Mode sound so sad, but also like this kind of yeah. sadness that makes you want to like release it through like dance at three in the morning or something? I don't yeah. know. It speaks to me. Um, yeah, me too. And so, and so I really just started to research those sounds. And and by the way, the 106 is arguably a better synth. There's just something with the low end <laughs> on the synth. You don't, you don't have to defend yourself with me. No, it's, it's true. It's true. Man. I mean, we're still I mean, friends. I'll still ask Felicia for your number. I mean, <laughs> the, 106, the 106 is a way more intuitive, interesting synth in terms of the way you can move around it. Yeah. The presets. Um, there's something with the low end on the six. I don't know what it is. It's just. Yeah. It's, it is a more mus- mus- musical low end. The 106 is more of a sledgehammer low end. Yeah. Which lends itself well to hip hop, you know? Totally. I'm, I mean, right. I have, I, I, whenever I'm not, um, if I'm not in my place, it's usually a 106 because there's more of them and they seem to be more rentable. So, so I, I mean, I've had great times with it, but you know, when you, six right behind me. I love. <laughs> when you, uh, or when it's fair to, running around the country. Where do you record in Nashville? Where do you record in LA? Do you have favorite rooms that you go to? Oh, great question. Well, we just, on this last tour, we spent two days at Paisley Park. Oh, um, nice. Which was great. And remarkably unchanged. You know, we were in Prince's B room and he still has wow. these huge headphone boxes that like wheel around <laughs> that are, um, 
sound honestly kind of bizarre, but <laughs> but um, <Right. laughs> he, he loved them, so we were happy to play through them. And you know, I, I haven't done a, a ton of it, but on this last tour, um, I was just thinking, you know, we're, we're heading to Minneapolis, and I had a few ideas, and I just called my manager, and I just said, Can we go to Paisley Park? And he called, and know. we went and recorded, and, and it, it, it'd be something I'd like to do more of. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I'd love to record the Wilco Loft in Chicago. It's one of the coolest places in the mm-hmm. world. Um, mm-hmm. There's that place uh, in Texas. I, th- I think it's like a pecan farm. I forget what it's called. It's pretty far south. Mm-hmm. I've always wanted to record that. Um, mm. I forget the name of it, but, but there's, there's places everywhere. And uh, uh, the band is so good when we're on tour that that was the idea. It was like, well, maybe if we just pop into Paisley Park and we just set up live, we could get some cool stuff. And we did. Right, 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 right. Um, all right. This is the time where Dave's batter's box. So Dave, let's let's just firstly, let's, let's look at the history here. We've got Brooklyn and Jersey and Eastern <laughs> and Eastern European. But there's there's some tough hombres that have come out of there in baseball and football, and so you you got to bring the noise, man. You're You're, a, right. you're a South Floridian Spanish guy, so Dave, you you're you know you got to represent your people here because he may knock this shit just out the park and laugh at you while he's doing it. So I will step out of the way, and uh, off we go. If I really represent my people, no, I can't say that. that, that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Love, Thank you. I love my people. I love my people. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Melodies. Always. Mm. Major or minor? Minor. Lyrics. Um, forever. Mm. Key. Key? Key? The key of the song. A. That's right. I love 440. Makes me feel good. Musical hero. Brian, you know. Man, wow. Plugins. Sound twice. Introvert, extrovert, little Uzi vert. All the above. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you laughed her. I, oh. I came up with that and I thought, I can't get away with that. Anyway. Oh, yeah, that's one of the that best questions you've ever asked. If I can win today. I want you to remember that, Herb. That's, 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 that's a huge win. It's a huge win. Good. That's a win for culture. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Absolutely. <laughs> I should have put that last. Inspiration or hero? Inspiration. Okay. Yeah. Insp- inspiration you get you can have a cup of coffee with. Hero is not real. Right. right. Okay. Uh don't give me something obvious. Give me something obscure. If 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 everything behind you caught fire, what would you try to save? Well now do you want me to fire it? Can I can I quantify this and then give my answer? Sure. Or do you want to wrap yeah, yeah, yeah. fire? Yeah. No, 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 this, this 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 gets into a bigger question of Oh you know, there, there's there's things that are okay. worth a lot, and then there's things that are emotionally yeah. worth a lot. You know what I mean? Right, right. So you know, when everything catches fire, I save. Um, I save. Uh, mm, you know what? I'm looking around. I'm looking at all these instruments. I save my fucking hard drive that has my heart and soul on it. There you go. That doesn't count. The, the, the right answer was the, the unit you create on, but. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you. That. Or, 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 or your cat. It could be your cat. You know, it could be your dog. I got no. I got no living thing in this apartment. My yeah. You know, I'm gonna double down. My heart and soul is on there. If everything there else burned down, that that shit. That's my diary. That's my. That's my legacy. That's everything. All you, you know, and that is. Uh, I don't know what else. You know, birth certificate. Who fucking needs it? I mean. <laughs> I got a lot of sentimental shit in this, like in this, like I mean, this place is filled with just like endless wow. senti- sentimental things. It looks right. a little bit less than last time we saw it, though. No, it's only gotten more. It's just the lights dim. So, oh, but it, oh. yeah, the, no, it, it's it's only gotten more. Um, but that's the only thing that's completely irreplaceable. And and yeah. and you know what? It might sound like a stock answer, but it's just true. Well, here's the other part of it. For the for the classes of musicians coming up. An artist coming up, and for the the sanctity and 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 the and just the foundation of the work you've done, we need your hard drive saved so that the impact <laughs> of Jack Antonoff is never ever ever Wait, forgotten. But I'm possibly changing my answer because I just looked over and I actually have my physical diary from when I was 17. Oh, a lot of shit going on in my life, and I actually wonder 
if that mm. is a more valuable thing. Shit, this is a big one, Dave. Are you they, know, when you, when you first said the question, I was like, my OB8. I was like, you know, my telecast. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's some if there's some chapters on sex in your 17 year old diet uh, diary, you know, we'll we'll go with that one. God, looking back at that stuff, how embarrassing could we all be? Jesus. Oh my God, yeah. yeah. I, also, just like my emotions, I was so I was just everything oh. was so big. The most oh, yeah. dangerous time in one's life is when they think they're an adult and they're not. When oh, you're fucking the 15, who gives a shit? When you're like 18, 19, 20, and you're like, I'm an adult. This is what it is to be alive. And you just start yes. functioning that way. Like that shit was wild. But sorry, yeah. batter's box, batter's box. No, Keep no, no. Me. I mean, but but you listen, there's that's where a lot of these that's where a lot of bad stuff can happen. Somebody yes. in that position and and I, I was a, I was a good kid and I barely made it through that time. Yeah, yeah. I think it's true of all of us. So bad kids, you know, that and a gun, and you don't know what you have. <laughs> that said. Um, you know, it, it's just never an interview when you're on the show. It's just three dudes hanging. That's, that's how it's supposed to be. It's the best kind. Yeah. 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 No, we, um, Dave, all right, Dave, little Lucy vert, introvert <laughs> or extrovert. Classic. And Classic. By the way, when you said introvert or extrovert, my, my answer before you said little Uzi vert, I was going to say both. And then you said the Uzi Vert, and he actually might be, <laughs> and this might be the genius of the question. He might be the ultimate introvert extrovert because he's so yes. he's so guarded and, and sort of in his head. But then he'll just. Yeah. By, you know, his, by the his, way, his, by the way, I thought of that because uh, I, 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 you know, I'm not real one for like long term preparation. I like it more closer to the to whatever we're doing. But uh, that came into my head about four four. Uh, Guests ago, and I and I and I saved it for you. So thank you so much. Well, not not only is it a Pensado classic, I'm just amazed personally that you classic. held it for four guests ago. I mean, yo, man, this is that is literally one of the best lines ever for this show on this episode. <laughs> Wait, Dave, no question doubt. for you: Is there more batter's box? Because I don't want to derail. If there is, no, we're done. We're done. We're done. We're okay, done. then 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 I gotta throw it right back to you. Plug yeah. in. Oh, my favorite plug in. Right now, it would be, uh, you know, the easy thing is to say my own plug-in. Uh, it might be, though, if that's it. Well, I, I, I do love my plug-in because it's got my whole heart and soul in it. But um, I, tend to, I tend to go to the simpler ones like, 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 like Renaissance compressor, uh, stock EQs, things like yeah, that. Me too. And those are those those are the those are the meat I've chosen, and then the other plugins are how I've I've seasoned the meat, how I've you know that sort of thing. So so I I like the simple plugins, and but yet I use a lot of the an awful lot. There's just there's a um, it's like picking children. You 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 love your children, but you love them all different, and nobody ever really says that out loud. But that's the case. You love them the same amount, but but different. And so, you know, you want me to give you a list of like the plugins I use the most? The Massenberg MDW Limitless, um, a, a one called Boost that's kind of obscure. Um, I like um, uh, a lot of UAD, the CL1B, uh, their tape recorder. Yeah. Signal tape, I love the Sound Toys tape. I can go on and on. We're going to run out yeah. of time. But you know what I love? A, a, a really, I don't know if a lot of people are using it, but it's a thing called Black Box. It's a reverb. Well, well no, Black Box is a, is a, the one I know of is a, is a saturation tube. No, so I have a thing called, um, I think it's the Black Box Spring. Let me double check it. Hold on one sec. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a very simple plugin, mm -hmm. um, but it's got a real... It's, it's, there's something about it. I've been throwing it on because I was there. I found a space between Valhalla reverbs and mm, yeah. this black box where if I, if I kind of, if I, if I use them both, they're, they're total mm. opposite, like a Valhalla room and this black box spring thing. There couldn't be more opposite sounds. Um, and they, mm. they work in this really cool way. Um, I'll try it. To that. I, 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 that might've slipped past me. I, I, I think yeah. I've heard of it. Are you doing Can a lot of, um, like when you're working, like how, how often are you going out of the box to, for effects? Um, I, uh, I, I use my EQ4M by Mog. I use my Clarifonic by Kush. Um, I use a thing called Spacecraft. Uh, it's a, oh. uh, 
from Dr. MS. I, I, I don't use too many because I don't like to uh, document them. <laughs> but I, 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 have, I have a lot of things, and, and I might use an average mix. I'll use four or five, but they might be different. Yeah. But the ones I mentioned, those are in Iraq, you know. So, yeah. And two things along this line, uh, Jack, if, you know, when we run across things that we like, we like, we like to let our friends know about it. So can we send you Please. a couple things that we know of? Please. Leap Wings, Ultravox. Please. Because it's, it's, a, it's, it's funny because you have these endless, uh, there's, there's so many fucking cool things. And, yeah. and, and, and even if you're not spending a lot of money, half the cool shit is already on your, your, your baseline yep. deal. Like, like, like you were saying, Dave, like a lot of like stock plugins are really cool. Yeah. Um, and just like living in a city or something, you end up just kind of hanging out in your three block radius. So it's like, for, yeah, exactly. you know, for as much great stuff in there, it's like, sometimes it takes someone coming along saying, Hey, open this plugin. Otherwise, you know, Whoa. if it's if it's Echo Boy and, and yeah. Decapitator yeah. and Black Box and yeah. the Hollow Room, you you really end up, and it's yeah. not a bad thing because you just because obviously within one plugin, there's a million ways you know how to work with it. And it becomes a part of your brain. Yeah. But I do love it when someone's like, "Stop! Actually, try this plugin." All right, just, so we'll send you we'll send you a couple things. Yeah, like yeah, Leap Wing, Alphorn, uh, John McBride's got a new plugin that 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 is really good. There's, Incredible. There's a few Incredible. things and like, really. Yeah. The, the other thing I wanted to ask you before we wrap up, because you do a variety of things musically as, as depending on what the project is, do you get the different sort of end result by using different mixers or do you have the same mixer do all the stuff that you do? No, we, we, we move around. You know, there's the, my mix process is, uh, I would say about 50% of the time me and Laura which is sort of that's that's who engineers everything with me. We'll mix the record, and then and then for other stuff we, we send it out. And you know sometimes big guys that everyone knows, sometimes new people. Um, but you just mixing is a funny thing. You know you're you're, you're looking for that that um, whoa. You know you, you just you just put it together and it feels so good. Sometimes um, when we get it so kind of close, it it, it can be tough, but. Uh, usually if, it, if it's a bigger record with, with a, with a, with a pretty serious amount of low end information happening mm -hmm. and I, and I want it to hit a certain way is, is when we'll, we'll take it out there because if, because if it's, you know, if, if there's not a, if there's not a ton happening that needs to react a certain way in the low end, then I, I pretty much know what I want to do. with Where it. Go. Got it. Yeah. Got and it. usually, and usually, um, and that process started for me kind of just, mastering our our roughs which is what we call mm -hmm. them but you get mm -hmm. to a point where your rough is a mix right and you know there, there's no secret thing that someone is doing you know you just it's just hours and hours and years and years and years of knowing how to carve and where to put things right 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 but i'm not i'm uh, not there yet i'm not there yet with it with a kind of punchiness and a kind of low end so that that's when I'll, I'll i'll send things out there but but if I, but if i don't want something to punch a certain way and it's not too subby and I'm not trying to figure out that punch in that sub, then I, um, then I'm usually happy with what I can do. Well, last thing before Dave wraps us up. Um, do you find yourself ever getting turned on to Sorry, That's my Finn. Okay. Come in and meet Jack. That's my dog. Um, do you ever find yourself turned on by like a young songwriter that you get turned on to and say, God, let's collaborate. Or do you keep that kind of, that world small so so you know where you're going that world is pretty small not because i don't love tons of new people here coming up but just uh i feel kind of flooded trying to sift through my own ideas like i don't sure. often i don't often think to myself like um oh i got to get that with with that person if anything i think more like oh i just got to kind of stay get in this this on my head yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 no i get it um, um we are you know to say that we're fans, it, it just seems cliche. But more importantly, I think it's so cool that we're friends. We're friends, um, now, man. When when you when yeah. on on time two, you can't get rid of me now. I'm I'm a friend. Oh no, we're in, we're in, and, and and we and we share Leslie Lewis. Shout out to her; she's incredible, the best. Um, and you got you got my info now, so I'm around. Oh yeah, yeah, and and vice versa. I will um, be sitting in this room for many years, <laughs> and 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 us here too. And thank God for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah uh jack antonoff the absolute best you guys dave, are the best dave take us home guys um one of the things that i'm reminded of today is 
music and the, making music and the greats, it's not a profession. It's not a, it's not a something uh, you really want to do. It, it's a lifestyle. And the way you can tell it's a lifestyle because it usually starts with a seed that you're young, that you're trying to keep from fully growing and, 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 and providing fruit. You don't want that fruit anymore in your life. And so take stock of yourself, see if you see if you've got the lifestyle and if you really want to go somewhere in this in this profession of ours. Use your use use your childhood, use the things in your life and use the things that, that mean something to you. And the odds are that a, a few million people will, will be helped by that and will also like you for that. I know that's kind of nebulous and vague and ephemeral, but uh, it's the truth. See you guys soon.